Hi, I'm Tom Kozaczynski and I'm a results leader. You're listening to resultsleader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. You are listening to resultsleader.fm, but you already knew that. I mean, the guy, the announcer guy, he said that, didn't he? I know why you're here too. You're here so I can share another awesome interview with you. And you're in luck because that's exactly what I have. Today's guest is Mr. Tom Kozachinsky. He's a London-based product design consultant, speaker, tech stars mentor, and stand-up comedian. He and I have a couple laughs on the show, and we go deep into flawed money beliefs. Let's jump in. Tom, my man, welcome to the show. Are you ready to rock it? Hi, Jonathan. Yes, I am. And thank you. It's a privilege being here. All right. Let's jump in with an easy one. What book or books have you given most as a gift? Okay. This is an easy one. Last Christmas, I gave out 11 copies of Almanac of Raval Navikant. I've never heard of that. What is it? Tell me oh, more about really? it. Oh, <laughs> really? Uh, Naval is, I think, the, I, I, I don't want to sound like a fanboy, but like the living, uh, I don't know, I'd call it like a, a IT Buddha type uh-huh. of guy. So he's the guy who founded, uh, oh, sorry, my mind is blanking. Oh, please fix this in, in post. Uh, uh, he, he's the guy that founded AngelList, and he does a lot of, uh, tweets around the building startups, building companies, a lot of stuff around building businesses and how to conduct your life in general. Like he has some really great insights into into our industry, and I really like reading his stuff, listening to him, his podcasts, and he's he puts out generally a really great content, very relevant to us. All right, love it, man. Something new that we haven't heard of. So tell me a story of how you turned a failure into a success. <laughs> Okay. And uh, not counting myself as a failure, right? So (laughs) uh, one thing that, okay, I'm going to go way back now. I started a job that I just couldn't couldn't deal with the the 95 grind. And after quitting my my college to go working in the industry, it it felt like something that I could do. I don't have to finish college because I know this and I'm going to take it. And and, and I just couldn't find myself being there every day. And I didn't click with the people. And I quit because I felt like it's not for me. And it felt like a failure. And out of a sort of a proverbial middle finger, I started my own company and I've been working for myself ever since. So I think that's the biggest one that I would use as an example. Yeah. The old, uh, I'm unemployable line, huh? Uh, nobody can yeah, employ me yeah. except for me. <laughs> I'm living there with you, brother. I couldn't have a job even if I tried. So what would you say, Tom, is the most worthwhile investment you have ever made? Can I name two? Yes, of course. Number one would be my wife. And in terms of I invested all of my life, uh, all of my love into this person because she's so amazing that she really is my number one fan, my number one supporter. And the dividends being paid back through through that support are just unmeasurable to what I can do because up until her, until I met her, Everything I did, I felt I was doing with a lot of weight on my shoulders. And when she came along, it was just lifted. So that's number one. And number two, I would say it was just investing in a bunch of books and uh, my first Kindle. So just investing time in reading. Nice, nice. Sometimes I joke around, my wife is Filipino. I say, yeah, I invested in her. Mail away bride. No, not really. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's not right. All right. So in the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Okay. I had a a struggle a lot with believing that money is kind of bad in terms of if you make a lot of money, it somehow makes you evil or bad. And I think maybe that's due for me coming from relatively poor country and everybody like a lot of people with with money are either like politicians or or corrupted people or whatever and kind of growing up in that environment it just feels like if you have a flashy car if you have a 
you show a lot of uh, wealth, it kind of means that you, you didn't make it in a in a decent way. And kind of growing up in that environment kind of felt that, oh, if I'm making a lot of money, I'm somehow a bad person. And it took me a lot of time to unravel that and kind of grapple with my relationship that money can be a good thing. And just because people are paying me a lot of money for services that I provide, that I, that doesn't make me a bad person. And uh, it kind of gives me a lot of opportunity to give back and to help people around me. But it took me a lot to sh- change the focus and change the mindset of, okay, I have money now. I moved to London. We are now really well. Uh, money-wise, and it took me a, uh, a while to kind of combat that and change the focus and see see the perspective of how I view money changed. So a couple questions on that. Number one, how did you realize that you had a problem with your money mindset? And number two, what were some of the steps you took to fix your money mindset? So I realized I have a problem when I was talking to people who are not Croatians, who are people from UK, people from US. And I would say, I will, I'm doing this, I'm consulting with the, that company, helping this startup. And they would ask me, like, how much are you charging for this? And I would say, oh, I'm doing this for free because it brings me joy. And I was basically didn't didn't charge the monetary monetary value. I was, yeah, don't look at me like that. I didn't, <laughs> like I wasn't charging the monetary value. I was kind of doing it for the social accolades. Like, oh, this guy is helpful. He he does this for the nobility of his soul, but he's not taking money. And then when they would ask, like, why are you doing this for free or for, you know, for lunch? Like, oh, I, of course I will help you with your startup. How much do we owe you? Oh, nothing. Just pay me lunch. We're going to be fine. And, and a lot of people started poking around that. Like, why are you doing this? And I would say, well, it kind of feels that I, if I'm asking money, it doesn't feel that I'm being genuine. It kind of feels that I kind of had this feeling that being salesy is bad. And if you're trying to sell something, you're kind of doing it with, with uh, fingers crossed behind your back and you're not being genuine. And then a couple of people that I really admire and respect, they started kind of poking around, uh, drilling a bit deeper to see where does this belief come from. And I was really honest with them. And when I started to get defensive around my beliefs, they were drilling me and they didn't stop. And I didn't know why am I holding to this belief. And when they asked me, I couldn't explain why I think this is true. And at some point I was like, I don't know, I need to, I need to think about this. So a couple of people gave me a couple of really good books, a couple of articles, and I, to be honest, I meditated on it, uh, thinking about uh, where does it come from. This is when I realized that it's a lot to do with my environment I was raised in, a lot of uh, perception of people around me, and that I was just being conditioned by my environment. And it took me a while living here in in London to kind of dissolve that and, and change the entire attitude towards money money itself. What did you have to do to start changing that attitude? First, after reading those couple of books and and being forced around it, I had to come to terms that just accepting that whatever I'm doing and the ways I'm helping uh, people in their companies is worth the money that I think I would like to charge. And it took me, if I'm freelancing and somebody asks me how much for a website or a logo or whatever, I have the prices. When it comes down to consulting and actually sitting down, having lunch, being more of a casual setting, I didn't know how to put a price on that. Is it hourly? Is it being effective? Or I just didn't know how to wrap my head around it. And then it was just easier to go, oh, well, just pay lunch and we're going to be good. And I started being fairly honest about that up front and just to tell the people, okay, I'm going to help you, but it comes with a fee. And some people don't like that, some do, but I kind of came to terms that not everybody can be my friend and I don't have time for invest in every relationship to become friends where I that, where I can actually do it for free. So it's just like, I want to really help you. I have a lot of knowledge. I have a lot of experience and it's going to cost you or we're not going to do that because there are people that I can help that will actually pay me money. What are some bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise? I know that some people would kill me uh, when I say this, but uh, industry is really fast and a lot of things we have done to death. And I'm a believer in testing some of the hypotheses, especially when you're building a new startup or new service. But there are a lot of things that have been tested and done to death that we can really skip through and just use our knowledge and 
best uh, experiences, just apply those, especially when we are building early stage uh, products or ideas. And a lot of people believe in going really slowly, being meticulous a lot around a lot of stuff. And I believe in uh, moving fast. And the worst, uh, one of the worst uh, advices I always get is like test every step, test uh, a lot, like test often, validate every little piece of information, which really just puts a lot of time constraints, puts a lot of cost into whatever you're building. And I would just say, okay, let's just nail 80% and doesn't, then fail at 20 rather than test to a 99% certain. Now he's talking about speed, ladies and gentlemen. What you don't know is I think you're the fastest person that ever got from pre-interview to interview. I think it's only been a week or 10 days. So he is, he is really about the speed. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Cool, cool. All right. I know you were getting into that and we were just about to get into my favorite part where we talk about results. But first, I want to ask you a question. Are you picking up what we're laying down on this show? Are you digging what we are sharing? If you are, why not make yourself a hero today and share this with somebody who can use it? Put this out on your social media channels. Hashtag results leader FM. I'll be out there looking for you and I'll make sure to boost it up too when I see you. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's jump back into the interview. So let's move into what this show is really about. Results. Tom, why do results matter? <laughs> because there's nothing you can get out of empty promises, right? So I'm one of those that believe, like, show me what you've done. Don't tell me what you've done. And don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me. I kind of feel maybe this belief goes into a little bit of esoterical thinking. But sometimes when I say to people what I'm going to do, it rarely comes to fruition. It, it, it's always kind of just talking about something maybe internally feels like that's been enough. Well, people, I say I have an idea. People say, yeah, that's a great idea. Do that. And it just kind of gets validated. And then I kind of feel, okay, then I don't have to do it. Obviously, this idea has merit. It would be successful. So I move on to something else. So now, now kind of came to a belief that if I have an idea, I'm going to put time into this, show that it works by putting work in and showing results. And it actually, in the last couple of years, it, it shows that it's better than just talking about it. Man, this is a recurring trend on this show. We keep hearing you guys saying, don't talk about it, be about it. Put in the work. And I am a fan of that. So in the last five years, what new realization has helped you get better results for your clients? Okay. I kind of realized that a lot of clients, my clients at least, they know where they want to be and they kind of know what they need, but they cannot always explain it. And what I learned is that I need to speak problems in their language and then translate my solution to the same kind of dialect. What that kind of comes down to is I work with different business owners from different industries. They all have the same goal, make sales, make better product make money, of course. But sometimes they will think they need something when it's in true something else. So there's a difference between what client think they need and what they actually need. And when I come in, I'd like to tell them, I want to help you reach your goal. But since you're paying me and you're trusting me, please allow me to tell you what I think we, it needs to be done and just trust me on the process. And then if it doesn't work, I'm more than happy to, if, to some of the people, I, I so strongly believed in what I'm saying. I was like, if this doesn't work, it's for free. It, it doesn't matter because I knew it's going to work. And it, it started when I was really young, when I started my first business, we were building websites. I would come to uh, like a pitch meeting. And this is a true story. I would talk 30 minutes about the importance of having a website. This is how long ago I started my business. <laughs> I was selling the importance of having a website. And some of the clients, one of the responses was, I don't need a website. I do everything in Microsoft Office, which was just mind boggling. This is where, when I realized that I need to speak their language, not my language, but I need to show them results. And in terms of new clients, new sales, whatever it Man, is. you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you so uh, much. Why you need a uh, website? What is this guy talking about over here? All right. All right. All right. I'm with it. So what area of your business would you like better results? Okay. 
I would love better results in my sales because I'm not a salesperson and I'm not a type of person that goes out and researches the market and then gets it. I'm a type of person that need, knows what needs to be done, but I just don't do it at speed up always relied on my network people I knew, people I worked with, and just kind of build up from there. And I always lacked in the area of, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to build this brand new relationships on a scale. I never was one of those people to do that. So this is definitely the area where I'm lacking. I'm kind of trying to make up for it in, in since Corona started. Just, well, I'm at home. I have nothing better to do. So so I'm just reaching out and, and seeing if I can do that. And and it's a whole new experience for me that I'm kind of now just learning, to be honest. So like what the, are you learning? Whole... What are you learning in that experience? Because you said you relied on essentially word of mouth and res- uh, referrals, and now you're doing actual business development. So what have you learned? So I read a book recently called Obviously Awesome, which talks about market positioning, which was for me sort of a very new thing. I knew that what market positioning is. And I thought, okay, obviously, if I say that we are doing uh, designs and customer experience and UX and UI, people know what it is. But by positioning and framing that for clients that I want to talk to is a whole different thing. And my clients are not usually executive people in companies. It's more of a product managers, product owners who know what the value of design within business is. So I need to speak to them, not to the C-suite of the company. And this is what I learned is that I need to reach, refocus my positioning and talk to people who are actually going to champion my services within the business. And, and this is one of the major things that I've learned in the last like five or six months. Big lesson there. So what results are you most proud of, Tom? Okay, a couple of those. One of the kind of things, so again, this we come back now to what doesn't make me money, but it brings me joy, is when I go out pre-COVID, travel the world, deliver my talks and workshops on freelancing and building a career in IT, and then I get an email six months later, 12 months later from people who were who were at my lecture. And then they said to me, like, you inspired me to do this. I started my own thing or I went freelance or I started a company and it's 12 months later, I'm kicking ass and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. And that really fills me up because I know I made a difference. And this is the results that I value over monetary ones. But I'm not uh, gonna lie, I'm not immune to seeing a lot of zeros on my bank account either. So <laughs> in the last year or so, I've I've helped a couple of companies build the products from ground up that have now gathered series A and B rounds that are really kicking ass. And I know that my work, my design helped them go there. And it's really great to see. I've put my actual uh, time sweat and tears into this. And now it's really making a difference. And I was well compensated for that. Excellent, man. Any parting thoughts for the results leaders who are listening to us right now? Yeah, this is one question that I kind of pondered a lot. uh, And I knew that you're going to ask it. One thing that I've came across a lot in the last couple of years speaking is I've seen people that do not have the confidence to do what they think they should be doing or they want to do. And when people come to me after the, after the talk or workshop or whatever, and they ask me, how do I start? How do I do this? And it sounds like such like there's a, this magical black box that you need to find and unravel. And then it happens. And, and people were like, how do I start speaking on conferences? Of course, you will not be speaking on South by if you send an application, but you start small, you start in your area, but you start doing that. And whatever you want to do, start and be bad at it. Just be terrible and just be terrible for a while and it's going to get better. And I know it sounds shitty, but uh, I started my stand-up comedy career like this 15 years ago and I was terrible comedian for 10 years. And and when I listen to my jokes from 12 years ago, I think they're horrible, but they are definitely better than, than ones from 10 years ago. So just do that. There's no right time. The time is right now is what Tom is telling you. Get out there and do it. I love it, man. Tom, thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you, results leaders, for tuning in. And we will be back in your earbuds next time. Thank you, Jonathan. This was awesome. That is a wrap for another edition of ResultsLeader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients and you want to be featured on the show, go to results 
leader.fm now and apply to be on the show. And if you love what you're hearing, share the show, give us a rating and review, do anything to help us get the message out there. Thought leadership is easy, but results leadership is hard. This is the podcastfactory.com.